Hi, I'm Mariah, the author of Faith's Journey, and we are on week three of our discussion based on Stephen Furtick's bestseller, Crash the Chatterbox. And if you're just joining us, then I encourage you to go back and listen to week one and week two of our discussion. So let's get started. So our base passage is actually gonna come out of Joshua chapter one, verses two to three. And what's happened is the Israelites have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. And now that Moses is dead, God is now talking to Joshua, who he has put over the Israelites. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. So when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan and they literally began stepping into their inheritance, we quickly realized that whatever battle they fought, even if they lost the first time, they came out victorious. Um, and these were the same people who 40 years ago were shying away from their own inheritance. Uh, they sent spies into the land of Canaan to scout it out. And only two of them came back with a good report. The other ones discouraged the rest of the people to go into the land of Canaan. They were afraid, saying that they were just grasshoppers in the eyes of these giants. God gives us promises to empower us to move forward. It's our incentive. But these Israelites were making excuses as to why they could not go into the promised land. And because of that, the natural consequence was that they would be wandering the desert for another 40 years. So when they finally come around and it's time, I'm assuming that they're ready to actually go to the promised land after 40 years of being in a desert. So once they cross over to the Jordan and they fight the battle of Jericho, they have other battles they have to fight in order to take what is theirs, what is theirs. So the battles that they fought, the more that they fought them, the more they won. And the more they won, the more land they reclaimed. And the more evident it became that God was on their side. He was their God and they were his people. And coming into the full realization that he is my God and I am his child has been and continues to be a journey in and of itself. Faith is a journey. It's an epic adventure with an ending already worked out by our author. And I've begun to embrace that this revelation is step is in step with my obedience. They go hand in hand. In order to realize he is my God more and more, it requires obedience in my part in listening to him. So the adversary or the chatterbox doesn't want you to have the reservation that you have chosen to fulfill God's purpose in spite of your weakness. He doesn't want you to know that. The enemy uses fear to keep us from embracing that reality. I love how Stephen Spurdick puts it. If the lie is the chatterbox native tongue, fear is its song. And the refrain only has two words. What if? What if nobody reads my book? What if I forget the lyrics to the song? What if they don't buy my product? See, we can be driven from God's God-ordained opportunities by endless what ifs. And the more we resist God or ordained opportunity, the more we resist a deeper relationship with God. And why don't we just call it what it is? It's disobedience. And we may be legit, legitimately scared. We may have valid excuses as to why we can't do something, but it's still rebellion. Resistance is rebellion. Resisting opportunity is actually rebelling against God. And that's the cold hard truth. So we're not the only ones to feel this way. We're not the only ones to feel that we're justified in our what ifs. Joshua and Jeremiah more than likely experienced fear. Um, God spoke to both of them, repeating similar phrases. Don't be dismayed. Be strong and courageous. I am with you. He kept repeating it because there was another voice that was in their minds that was stating the contrary. 
you should be scared. You're weak. He's not going to show up when you need him. We all have these things going on in our mind to keep us from moving forward. And the funny thing is that in the Bible, we're rarely told the thoughts that go through a person's mind. Most of the time, we're only told what they ended up doing. We don't know what David thought as he ran across that battlefield to face Goliath. But if we really take the time to think about it, if we take the time to put ourselves in that situation, I bet we could figure out what he was thinking. We don't know what Moses was thinking when he was walking across the palace, the throne room to Pharaoh to tell this, this king, let my people go. We had no idea what he was thinking, but if we put ourselves in that position, if we use our imagination, I'm sure our minds can come up with what was going through Moses' mind at the time. We don't know what was going through Abraham's mind when he stepped out of his hometown, took the first step out, and all before him is desert. We don't know what they were thinking, but we do know a couple of things. We know they were human. They were just like me and you. They had thoughts, they had feelings, you know, and they did not know what would happen next. We have the luxury of being able to read their lives and one sentence it's saying, oh, God told them to do this and the next sentence it says that they did it and this blessing and that blessing came forth. That we have the luxury of doing that. But in, the, in, the, in those three sentences could be 10 years, 20 years that have gone by and they don't know what was coming next. The second thing is that we know what God would say to them. He would give them promises. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You will be victorious. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. These promises were incentives for them to move forward in faith. And the third thing is we know that they would end up doing what they were told. They would obey. If we take a minute to imagine ourselves in their shoes, then we quickly realize how they probably felt fear but they didn't obey fear. They obeyed faith. And that's what God wants from us. See, the thing is, you're going to bow. You're going to bow. We have to decide, are we going to bow to faith in the Lord? Or are we going to bow in fear of the enemy? And yes, I know it's, it's much easier for me to just say these things than it is to actually do them. I've experienced this myself. I, I can say this, but I know what it's like to actually do something in spite of my fear. It is hard. It's not easy. It's difficult to choose faith over fear. Stephen Furtick says, our fears have been building alliances and forming terrorist cells all of our lives, collecting ammunition and drawing battle lines. From the time that you were a child and you tripped over yourself in front of the entire class, I actually tripped in front of my class and in, in, during graduation practice. Um, from the time that you got lost in the store as a child and you couldn't find your mom and you felt that that panic. Um, from the time that you had a birthday party and nobody showed up. It's in those moments that the enemy has been building a solid case to justify your what ifs, your fears. But from the time that you were chosen to lead in the school play, from the time that you got your first touchdown, you earned that promotion, you played hide and seek with your first friend, God has been building a solid case to justify your faith. And the fact that you've overcome every adversity up to this point is a testament to God's faithfulness. There is only one fear that is acceptable, and that is fear of the Lord. Abraham didn't leave his hometown with the capability of sacrificing his son to the Lord. His faith was built throughout his life in the wilderness and in Canaan that led him to being capable of leading his son up a mountain 
and binding his hands and laying him on the altar. God had been building a case to justify Abraham's faith and Abraham chose faith over fear. I remember one time I was in high school and I had invited my friends over to watch a movie and I had bought food. It was such a nice setup. I convinced my family to stay in their rooms and I waited and waited and not one of my friends came. And I remember that night so vividly. I, I smell the pepperoni. Like I, I remember looking at the TV as the movie started. I remember seeing the, the lime colored sectional couch to this day. I remember that. And I hadn't realized until recently how much that rejection affected me. I took it on that I wasn't good enough for my friends to show up, you know? And because I decided to wallow in that rejection, I actually rarely invited people to anything in my 20s because my fear was, what if nobody shows up? In my mind, the enemy built a solid case to justify my fear, but it wasn't the reality. <laughs> in reality, I have way too many memories to even count and pictures to prove of that my friends came to my home all the time, all the time. We always did things together, but I didn't recognize that reality. I was too busy focusing on this one-off rejection to have a realistic perspective. It's the full grown power of love that allows us to step out and face fear head on. And I won't act like our darkest what ifs don't ever happen. You know, I'm very realistic. Every once in a while, our darkest what ifs do happen. And when they do, what, what do we face? Is it heartbreak, humiliation, shame, loss, rejection? We're not immune to feeling the pain of any of those things. And since you're still alive, you're more than likely experienced your what ifs become a reality. He did cheat on you. They did betray you. She did abandon you. But look at you now. If you're watching this, then in spite of all of that, you made it. I remember being in a long-term relationship like years ago and me and this guy we were we were best friends uh but like horrible like horrible lovers and we stayed together out of convenience at a certain point but we were together for about three years um in the second year of our relationship, I remember the spirit of God telling me that I needed to put distance between me and him. Um, that we needed to, we just needed space. I remember the spirit of God telling me that and there were valid reasons as to why he would say that as well. Um, it's just, it wasn't random. I knew why the spirit of God was telling me that I needed distance. Um, but in spite of all that, I didn't, I didn't listen. And I didn't listen out of fear because I was too afraid of being alone. I was a single mother, you know? What if I would remain a single mom? I was too afraid of missing out or making a mistake. What if he was the one, you know? We had lasted that long. Why wouldn't he be the one? Um, and he was my best friend and I didn't want to lose our companionship. What if nobody got me? the way that he did, you know? So imagine my surprise when he basically falls off the face of the planet for about a month and then I find out he got engaged. It, talk about your worst what ifs becoming reality. I mean, every fear that kept me from obeying became my reality anyway. Imagine what would have happened if I had just done what the Spirit of God had told me. If I had just obeyed, I wouldn't have experienced the heartache that I went through, the worst heartache. 
I was at my lowest then and and do you know what I found at rock bottom solid rock on which I stand I offered God my broken heart and he mended it he was faithful and now I'm I'm not afraid of rejection and the fear of rejection doesn't keep me from pursuing God-ordained opportunity you may say no but I'm going to push forward you may not like what I'm going to bring forth, but I'm going to bring it forth. You know, what fears stop you? Is it fear of failure, inadequacy, uh, negative perception, rejection? Our fears may become a reality, but if and when they do, God is right there. I got up, I kept moving on. I accomplished a lot. And now relationships after that. I'm married now. Imagine if I stayed in rock bottom, refusing to climb out because of the fear, refusing to put myself back out there because of fear of rejection. I wouldn't be where I am today. So we must hear the spirit of God and obey in spite of our fears, in spite of our what ifs. We must choose faith over fear. It's the only way to cultivate a deeper relationship with God and ensure that we're going to do all that he has purposed and called for us to do in our time here on earth. And even if our what ifs do become a reality, even if they do happen, they can't stop us because God is faithful and he's true. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. At rock bottom, he will be right there. All things are working together for our good because we love him and are called. Our homework for this week is to take your thought capture journal and write down your what ifs. What do you believe God has purpose for you to do here on this earth? And then I want you to begin listing the what ifs to those things. What if I'm wrong? What if it doesn't work out? What if I'm rejected? What if they don't like it? Start writing all those what ifs down. I don't care if, they, if you think they're stupid, just write them down. Pray about them and allow time and space for the Spirit of God to speak to you truths and instructions concerning them. And it's very important that we give time for the Spirit of God to speak. We have to be still and quiet and just listen during prayer. Okay, so write those truths down and then I want you to begin preparing and declaring them over your life. God says, I am. God says, I can. Whatever those truths are, write them down and declare them daily over your life. And I hope that you all enjoyed the, this week's discussion based on Stephen Furtick's bestseller, Crash the Chatterbox. Have a blessed week.